Hello and welcome to Exploring Bible Characters, where we're beginning a new series on the early church leaders. Today, looking into the life of Stephen, a martyred leader. My name is Leslie Carroll, and it's my privilege to facilitate our study as we ask God to lead us into looking into His Word through the lens of its people. If you'd like to know any more information about this study or any of our studies, you can find information on LifeWay.com. Well, to believe in Jesus means to stake your life on Him, and the first generation of followers certainly had ample opportunity to test their faith. Stephen was among the first to model a biblical faith in Christ that comes at a great cost. One of the seven men chosen to handle the care ministry to widows, he not only was a compassionate helper, but also a confident witness for Jesus. Stephen spoke the gospel message boldly and persuasively. Some who heard him gave way to an uncontrollable rage, took him outside the city, and stoned him to death, making Stephen the first Christian martyr. Few, if any of us, will be called to die as Christian martyrs like Stephen. But we can take encouragement from his life, encouragement for all believers to demonstrate courage and confidence when we declare our Christian beliefs and values, even when some risk is involved. The example of Stephen should inspire us to exhibit boldness in our Christian living. So let's take a look into his life. Our key verses can be found in Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60, and they read as follows. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Well, what are some basic facts about Stephen? Well, I'll mention four. First, Stephen was the first among seven well-regarded believers who were chosen to carry out the early church's ministry to widows, a precursor to the church leadership role of deacon, Acts chapter 6. Second, God affirmed Stephen's spiritual power and grace by working miracles through him among the people of Jerusalem, Acts chapter 6. Third, Jewish leaders in Jerusalem arrested Stephen, charging him before the Sanhedrin of blasphemy against the temple and the Mosaic law. In his defense, Stephen recounted Israel's long history of rejecting God's chosen deliverers up to and including their recent crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 7 and 4. As the angry mob stoned Stephen to death, this willing martyr prayed to the Lord to forgive his executioners, a group that included a young Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus, who we will later come to know as the Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 7. Well, let's read about the choosing of the seven in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, and they read as follows. One through ten. In these days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue 
of the freed man, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Well, starting at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the early church experienced explosive growth. But that growth didn't come without challenges. The authorities had already arrested church leaders Peter and John, Acts chapter 4. But the growth continued. Now, by the time of Acts chapter 6, the church was presented with a different kind of challenge. Two cultural groups existed within the church in Jerusalem. The Hellenistic, the Greek-speaking Jews, had lived in the Greek-speaking world and culture and had migrated back to Jerusalem. The Hebraic Jews resided in Palestine, probably speaking both Aramaic and Greek. The difference between these two groups, however, was more than just language. They had different cultures and customs. So a complaint arose among the Hellenistic Jews they felt that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food, which was an organized relief system. Widows with no immediate family to support and care for their daily needs were, in that culture without today's social services, totally dependent on others for survival. Well, let me ask you, do you think this discrimination was the result of prejudice or resentment? Well, Actually, probably not. In all likelihood, the issue was only an oversight in administration of the system, but a solution was needed. So the Twelve Apostles summoned all the church members to solve the problem. The proposal was to select seven men to serve the needs of the widows. As a result, the Apostles were freed to preach the gospel and the church continued to grow. Stephen, whose name means crown, is listed first among these seven. Because his name is Greek, he probably was a Hellenistic Jew who then became a Christian. We know, however, that Stephen did so much more than wait tables. He met the qualifications of being of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, full of faith, and full of grace and power. Wisdom, faith grace and power, and the Spirit's presence marked Stephen as a Christian who was well equipped for his role. Stephen quickly moved beyond waiting tables to giving a powerful witness to the gospel among the Jews who were not Christians. The authenticity of Stephen's ministry was distinguished by great wonders and signs. The term wonders refers to miracles that drew observers awe and amazement. Signs were miracles that gave evidence of God's presence and activity and conveyed spiritual truths. God was working through Stephen in unusual and powerful ways. To this point, only the apostles had performed such deeds. Synagogues had arisen during the Babylonian exile as centers of worship and education and particularly were devoted to reading and expounding the law. The freedman's synagogue was made up of Cyrenians and Alexandrians, as well as some from Cilicia and Asia, one synagogue with four groups. The term freedman's synagogue indicates that these Jews were liberated slaves or they were descendants of Jewish slaves who were taken to Rome earlier. As Stephen boldly preached about Jesus, they interrupted him, seeking to refute what he said. They were, however, unable to refute Stephen's message. Through wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit, Stephen argued effectively against his opponents. Please note, for those who believe in Jesus, we have that same Holy Spirit in us to give power and wisdom. We know that Stephen was wise in the scripture. We are also told that his opponents could not withstand the spirit by whom he spoke. In the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit empowered believers over and over again for bold witness. Later, the apostle Paul told the Corinthians 
that his preachings were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that their faith would not be based on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. Let's take note. The Holy Spirit still empowers believers today to be bold witnesses of Christ. Now, let's read on about Stephen being seized in Acts chapter 6, verses 11 through 15, and they read as follows. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were seated in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Stephen's boldness in standing by his Christian convictions aroused intense hostility. When members of the Freedman Synagogue were unable to best him in debate, they brought forward false witnesses against Stephen. The synagogue members either paid these false witnesses or persuaded them, telling them what to say They contrived to frame up. These accusers claimed they heard Stephen speaking blasphemy against Moses and against God. Now it's noteworthy that they named Moses before God, almost putting him on a par with God. The phrase blasphemous words refers to speech, sowing disrespect for God and for anything that was sacred. To accuse Stephen of disrespecting either the great lawgiver Moses or of God himself was a surefire way to get him into trouble. The penalty for blaspheming God was death by stoning. Mm. That's quite a bit different from our society today where the casual use of God's name in profanity seems rampant. I'm so sorry to say. Stephen's accusers stirred up three groups. The people in general, the elders who were respected leaders and represented the Sadducees, and the scribes, most of whom were Pharisees. Elders and scribes made up part of the Sanhedrin, the Jews' high court. They came on Stephen suddenly, seized him forcefully, and took him to the Sanhedrin. This occasion was the third time the Sanhedrin had faced followers of Jesus. First time was Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. Second time was the apostles in Acts chapter 5. And now this third time was Stephen in Acts chapter 6. The first such trial ended in a warning, the second with a flogging, and the third trial would end with Stephen's death. Apparently, the accusers pointed to Stephen's words about the law and the temple. Stephen likely realized what the sacrificial death of Jesus implied concerning animal sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem. They would no longer be necessary, and they were now obsolete. Now, whether Stephen proclaimed this opinion publicly is not known, but what we do know is that he stated publicly that the true worship of God could not be limited to the temple. Stephen preached so clearly about Jesus that the case against him was tied directly to Jesus' teachings. Jesus once spoke words that led some people to suppose that he planned to destroy the temple. Early in his ministry, Jesus had stated, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. John chapter 2, verse 19. But these words were no statement of a plan to attack the temple. Rather, he spoke about his body, his crucifixion, and rising from the dead three days later. Jesus also had strongly asserted that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Although he often interpreted the scriptures differently than the Jewish teachers did. Jesus did, however, challenge the validity of the oral traditions that had been added to the law. The religious leaders 
considered these interpretations to the law as sacred as the law itself. Any presumed or real attack on what the Jews regarded as the law would rile them. Thus, the charges that Stephen had spoken against the law were serious. In our society today, which is increasingly hostile to Christian beliefs and values, people may accuse us falsely as believers. We exhibit boldness when we offer Christian beliefs and values as a defense in a calm and encouraging way, listening to what the other person is saying and responding with facts based on scripture. Mm. We need to know the scripture, don't we? As we respond, it's best to use yes and rather than yes but. One of the differences between Christians offering a defense and being put on the defensive is our attitude. Christians offering a defense of the gospel have an attitude of protecting and justifying actions or words of truth in the Lord. Christians on the defensive have an attitude of trying to protect and justify themselves. Stephen had the full attention of the Sanhedrin. God gave his face a supernatural shining appearance that drew his audience to look intently at him. The Holy Spirit fills Stephen with power for fearless testimony and the glow of heaven itself was revealed through him. The speech that follows in Acts chapter 7, which we'll read some of next, gives evidence of Stephen's continued boldness. As believers, we are called to exhibit boldness in standing up for our Christian beliefs and values even when others are hostile toward our claims. We can do so by the power of the Holy Spirit, just like Stephen. Now, let's read the end of Stephen's speech and about his stoning in Acts chapter 7, verses 48 through 60, and they read as follows. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all things? You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even kill, kill those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Oh, at this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. In response to the charges made against him, Stephen gave a lengthy and strong defense of the gospel for most of Acts chapter 7. He reviewed Old Testament history, stressing that God could not be found to one area, the promised land, or to one particular place, the temple. Abraham, Joseph, and Moses experienced God's call and power outside of Canaan, the promised land. With Moses as leader, God delivered the Israelites from Egypt, yet the people rebelled against God, worshipped an idol, and longed to return to Egypt. Through Moses, God had the Israelites build a portable tabernacle to symbolize his presence with them as they traveled. Only later, 
did Solomon build the temple in Jerusalem. Stephen implied that the tabernacle was actually a more appropriate symbol for the temple in Jerusalem because it was not stationary. These words, the words that we read in verses 49 and 50, to emphasize that God does not dwell in buildings, Stephen actually quoted from Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, which read, This is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. Stephen knew the scripture and quoted it as necessary. Stephen then described the Sanhedrin members as stiff-necked and as having uncircumcised hearts and ears. The term stiff-necked means stubborn. Regarding circumcision, the Sanhedrin members were proud of their physical circumcision that marked them as members of God's covenant people. But they had failed to take God's revelation of himself to heart. They had failed to hear him and to obey him. As their ancestors had done, the religious leaders persisted in resisting the Holy Spirit. In their long history, the Israelites had rejected and killed the prophets, God's spokesmen, who had foretold the coming of Christ. When Jesus came as God's promised Messiah, the religious leaders betrayed and murdered him, thus behaving just like their ancestors. Lastly, Stephen referred to the Jewish tradition that God gave the law to Moses through angels. Having received the law in the most impressive way possible, the religious leaders failed to keep it. They broke the law that they were now accusing Stephen of speaking against. The Sanhedrin members could not refute Stephen's logical, biblical, and spirit-empowered words, but they didn't repent and accept the truth that Stephen presented. Instead, they gnashed their teeth in an expression of rage. By the Spirit's inspiration, Stephen received a vision of God's heavenly throne room. He saw God's shining brilliance and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, the position of honor, majesty, and authority. What an amazing and beautiful scene, a gift from God in the middle of all these circumstances, charges, and persecution. Our God still reveals himself today. The biblical text is clear that the ideas that Stephen expressed brought on the wrath of the synagogue. The scriptures do not tell us, however, why Stephen chose to argue boldly his points before the Sanhedrin. It is not likely, this early in church history, that Stephen was deliberately looking for death as a conscious imitation of Christ. Instead, Stephen was probably following the example laid down earlier by Peter and John. When commanded to stop speaking of Christ, Peter and John replied that they had to obey God rather than man, and they could not stop bearing witness to Christ. Let's read their beautiful words in Acts chapter 4 verses 18 through 20 and they read as follows. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Thus, Stephen was not seeking death. He was witnessing faithfully to his convictions about Christ without regard to the consequences. Stephen knew that he had to be faithful in representing Christ to others, even if it meant death. The word martyr, at its root meaning, translates as witness. Stephen was being a faithful witness to Christ. Stephen's death proved to be a forerunner of Christian martyrs through the centuries. Please note 
The impact of Christian martyrs is not in their deaths, but in their witness. Oh, we may not be called to be martyrs for Christ, but we are called to be witnesses for him. Let's do that today. Let's be witnesses of Jesus and for Jesus today. Oh, I hope you've perhaps learned some new things or been reminded of some things as we've looked into the life of Stephen, a martyred leader. I know I have, and I'm so glad that you've joined me. There will be a contact slide that will come up shortly. I'd love to hear from you with any questions or insights, thoughts, whatever. I'd love to hear from you. And I hope you will join me next time when we will be looking into the life of Paul, the missionary leader. Oh, don't miss it. Come join me as we look into the life of Paul. So until then, God bless you and keep you.